I'm John Graft, and I love Chicago real estate. Between showings, I stop in my favorite places, talk with local business owners, and bring their story to you. This is my Chicago. Next month will be seven years. Seven years? Mm hmm I remember, because I started coming I sent here. in March. We had all of April to do the rehabbing, and then we had soft opened in May. And um, so, yeah, that was my, the genesis. Were you, where were you before this? What were you doing before this? Markets and online. Okay. Mm -hmm. How'd you fall into that? Because the mar markets are interesting. Shh. Are we recording? We're recording. We can oh, just, don't worry about it. Yeah, just keep going. Oh, so, okay, cool. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, I just, I was like, wait a minute, I'm not going to tell everything because he might want to use this. So no, now, tell, I, now I can just spill everything. it all. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. Uh, how'd you start it? Well, you know, uh, I guess it goes back to my youth. I'd always loved, um, like, old movies. I'd go see my great-grandmother who lived in Chadwick, Illinois, and they had a 19... Where's Chadwick? Chadwick, Illinois is rural. Okay. I, Carroll County. It'd be, I think now they've got... 400 people there? Yeah. How far from here? Yeah, small. It's about two and a half hours. Okay. Um, actually, a lot of people don't realize where my shop is. This is North Avenue. It's actually Route 64. Yeah. This literally cuts across the entire state and ends at the Mississippi River. And that's my hometown of Savannah, okay. which is in Carroll County, which is near Chadwick. So, yeah. It's, You're uh, from? I'm from Savannah, Illinois. Savannah, Illinois. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I would, we would go, of course, we'd always go to see great grandma and we would have, we'd go to her house and it was this battleship gray, just like my store. And, uh, before it was trendy, but the, uh, I would just sneak up into the attic and go into the upstairs and go through the old stuff. And, you know, my great uncle, um, uh, he had, his bedroom was still there and all of his jewelry and his watch and his, you know, and his suits were still in the closet and I would just go up there and. So I've always loved old stuff. I didn't ever think that at that time that it would ever be a career. I mean, I'm 51. I've been here um, going on almost seven years. And um, uh, so if I'd have known that, I would have kept a lot of that stuff that was in that house because nowadays it would be very valuable. But, you know, this was the 80s and, and who knew. But um, I had uh, originally thought, you know, I bought a... How do I start the story? Well, there was a... Well, it's kind of a funny... At the beginning. At the beginning, I went into a, um, a thrift store, first time ever, years ago, and um, I was looking, I think I was still working downtown Michigan Avenue, and I wanted to dress up as Pee Wee Herman for, for Halloween, and I was short for time, and so they were like, Richard, you know, there's a thrift up on Howard, and, and you, know, you should go over there, and I walked in and was going through the clothes, and, and I found the grave plaid suit I needed because that was, you know, the, the Pee Wee Herman look. But then I was digging and I'm going, oh my God, there's Dior, there's Xenia, there's like all these like brands. And then I was like, well, there's some really cool vintage too. I was like, oh, here's a 1940s suit. And, and then I had a light bulb. And I was like, well, I didn't think that that stuff was at a thrift store. Who would, yeah. you know, because it just wasn't part of my upbringing. We didn't have... Some people don't even know what thrift stores are. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Some people have never stepped foot in one. Yeah. I feel like it's the journey of everyone in their teens or 20s that you have to go to a thrift store at least once, right? I mean, it's, it's there's kind of something to that. You're in college, you're with some friends, you see a store, you pop in, you buy some old stuff, you wear it out that night. Right, right, right. Well, I, I would never do that. Because, <laughs> uh, well, that's the thing. I, with my particular business, that's one thing I do differently than a lot of the other competitors. It's like all my stuff is laundered and dry cleaned. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have the statement, and my friend said I should put it on my epitaph someday, that my shop doesn't smell like dead people. And I always go, I said, well, because a lot of thrift places you'll go into and it smells 100%. like it smells like dirty laundry. You, you walk in, they all smell the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the other <clears throat> thing I want to do differently for my business, I mean, which is also a, uh, affects the cost. But I still keep it reasonable because, I, I mean, I want this stuff to live again. I yeah. always tell people the story. I had a, two gentlemen that drove up in a, the beat-up old van. I'm like, yeah, we were driving by a house on the south side and they were throwing this stuff out the window and it was belted back suits and 60s shark skins and all this stuff. And I was like, that was all in the plastic. Wow. Sticky plastic because it's obviously been hanging in a closet for forty years, but um, but literally that stuff was destined for the landfill. And I and I tell people I said probably seventy five percent of my inventory was destined to be thrown away. I and bet. Like, and it's so sad. Some people don't want to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with it and how to get it off their hands. And hopefully they can make some money from it. But most people just want to get it out of their house when that time comes. Yeah. Especially well, if a, if someone dies. Well, I'm am dealing with a hoarder dig right now on Walcott and. Um, Armitage and uh, three generations the guy's been hoarding forever but <clears throat> we went in and into the closet and I was just like 
And they were like, yeah, we were just going to toss it all the dumpster. And a friend of mine suggested maybe I should look online and see, you know, if anybody would want this stuff. We didn't think anybody would want it. Yeah. And I was just like, are you kidding me? I mean, there was 1930s suits and 19 with coat, which I already sold. So for me, that that's the the, the also the great thing because some of them had history. Like one was like a really great menswear shop that used to be on State Street, and you know, so when I can partake and give, it's cool when you can see those labels. I mean, this is something you sold me. Mm-hmm. I think this thing's so cool. I get yeah. compliments on it. One of my jackets, uh, I get compliment every single day. I wear that thing. Yeah. I call it the tiger. It's like. I'll show, I'll show you later. Yeah. And then I have um, well, I a think sweater too. Your, your coat obsession, I think, has probably done you best that yes. when you've shopped here. Those were you, all, my, all the coats I have are from here. Actually, yeah, come yeah, think about it, except yeah. for like my Patagonian. That's it. Yeah. All the other ones are great. Yeah. They're fun. Like I want to put this one on before we go. <laughs> that, one, that one looks great. I couldn't 1920, pull that off. 1920s raccoon. Uh, originally, great great grandfather's collection, and again another man who was like, I just couldn't throw it away. But he's like, Oh well, I had the, the pelt had come apart at a seam. So I had to have it repaired and cleaned and glazed and stuff like that. But it's a, but it's also a large long, which doesn't happen in that era. So I knew that whatever I was going to spend on refurbing was going to be worth it. Like my dry cleaning, everybody was like, oh, God, competitors, t- like, we don't do any of that stuff. What I'm does like, it cost to dry clean this? Uh, this repair and dry clean on that, well, it's not dry cleaned. It's a fur clean. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a uh, they do it with um, sawdust. They run it through what? a bin which takes all the dirt and the oils out of the skin and out of the fur, oh. sawdust. And then, then they reglaze it, which means they put another oil, an oil sheen collective on it. And then we had the, the repair because one of the pelts in the front had come apart. So wow. So this is a little over 300 to get it back. To repair it. To repair it. And so what's the price on this? But that's a $1,200 coat. Wow. Because, okay. I mean, if you go online, you're going to find other ones, but they're usually shredded. And you got to pull on the furs looking for dry rot. Sorry, the guard hairs will, will give. What's the word of the guard? I know nothing about fur. Yeah. You, when you go to buy a fur, num- two things you want to check, especially the underarms and around the neck, you want to give it a good little pull because a lot of times if it's dry rotted, it'll pop. The okay. skin will just... What does dry rot mean? Dry rot means that the, the leather, the skin part of it has um, gone too long without being handled and then the, um, so then the skin just breaks apart. And so that's what the oil does? Is that part of it? Yeah. Yeah, because, okay. well, that's furs like that and leathers, especially they need to be handled. I mean, I'd say I tell people, I said, just hang it in your closet doesn't do it any good. I said, get it out, throw it on, wear it a little bit, you know. And if you're going to store it, store it in a charcoal bag that's going to let let some air flow and stuff. Plastic is the worst thing for uh, for fur. What's a charcoal bag? It's a uh, mesh. It's like a it's like just looks like a normal garment so bag, but it's made of charcoal, <laughs> which um, is antibacterial. Okay. And that's the other thing you want to be careful. And you never store them in an attic, and you never never store them in a basement because <laughs> okay. those are the too hot and cold, hot and cold in the attic, too much moisture in the basement. So you you have to be. But you know, men habitually. That's why a lot of my inventory people are like, oh, you've got so much stuff. I said it's taking me years of collecting. I mean, there's a yeah. there's a lot of time on these walls. You yeah. can tell. You can see it. You're here. You're like. Whoa. The first time I walked in here, I thought it was so cool. I was here for at least an hour and I yeah. came back with garbage bags of clothes. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, but it's, uh, it's important to have the cleaning and have it expected, but it's also the hunt and find men did not take care of their clothes. Like women did. I can't okay. tell you the amount of estate sales and, and private calls I caught it, as this as an example where it's just rows of clothes and then they just close the closet with the, and, or they've left a light on which causes the dry, you know, which will cause the the fade. Um, certain fabrics like rayons from the 40s and 50s, you can't do that. What is rayon? Rayon's a synthetic. Okay. It's just a, a weight. It's a hand. It's the way that the, that the threads are done. Um, but it was really popular in that era, but it also has a tendency to, to fade in light. So um, the further back I got in this particular closet, the closer to a window I got, the more you could start seeing on the shoulder. The got fade. it. And some I've bought not knowing, you know, I thought, oh, well, a little bit of fade, but it's, it's you know, it's a rockabilly, it'll move and stuff like that. And you pull on it and because the sun, because um, wool is a natural fiber and uh, you can't leave it exposed because it's, uh, that's also something to be careful of. Not all, and then, of course, moths, which are the bane of my existence. I can't tell you the times I've been in the house, like this one, some really great 20s, uh, 30s knits, but they were just like Swiss cheese. Holes. And you got to be careful bringing that stuff into the shop. The other reason why I dry clean. Okay. Because one infestation in a, in a coat would literally infest. People don't understand. It's not the big moths. I always tell people. A little little trip, a little inf put. It's the tiny little ones that you got to be careful with. The big ones, those aren't those aren't clothing moths. It's the small, clear. Like, those are the ones you see. Those are the ones that go into the fire. 
mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I think of moths, I don't even think of clothes, but I, I yeah. mean, here I'm like, oh yeah, that's a thing. It's the small ones. They're a little clear, kind of pink in color. They're tiny. Those are the ones you have to you have to be careful with. Yeah, it's. And everybody thinks, oh, it's a big moth. I'm like, yeah, that one you can leave it. That's, but it's the other ones that you got to be careful. It's not actually the moth itself. It's like it, because it's it's going into the garment to um, lay eggs, and then the, when the eggs that's what happens. That like eggs hatch. Then I it's, assume it's a worm, and that's why those holes are always usually so perfect because they're literally going around and around and around, and they're sucking out the protein of the the wool because wool again is like a hair. It's like a natural fiber. So is it only wool that moths? Wool, um, anything natural. So they, not necessarily cotton, but silk definitely, because again that has a that has a protein in, inside the fiber. So, and they want the protein, so that's why they do that. I would assume they're eating it or something. Mm -hmm. No, I always tell people I said, wouldn't it be funny? It was like, oh, they're sitting there like, mm, there's a good cashmere sweater, <laughs> snack, snack, snack. Yeah. No, it doesn't. No, that's worth it. Any moth, any holes you see, is actually a fact of the larva. That's actually from the the worm of the, um, the moth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where do you find these things? How do people find you? Like the place at Wolcott and Armitage, how did that come about? Uh, this woman, it was her, her three brothers, I believe. And she had just mentioned to a friend, she goes, you know, there's a guy on North that, that has vintage menswear. You know, it would be a shame for our great uncle's stuff to just go into that huge dumpster out front, which yeah. I would be like, <laughs> <laughs> because there were truly some amazing, amazing pieces in this collection. And I think it's also too, it's also... Um, she just couldn't really bear that. She loved him a lot. And she just, the thought of just throwing all of his, especially personal, like, yeah. You want pieces. to see life go back into those things. Yeah, and she just couldn't, thought the thought of just throwing them in the dumpster. Now, before I got there, they had already filled a dumpster, which I was like, oh my God, there's, if anybody was smart, when you are done, they'd be in here picking through all of this because there truly was some amazing, amazing things. Um, and why were they doing that? Were they, he passed away and they're selling the yeah, house? Yeah, he's passed. Um, the house is, uh, is unfortunately, the foundations are, done, much like my store. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the foundations, yeah, every wall has a monster crack in it. The foundations are shot. It's an older house. Um, it's the oldest on the block. It's one of the, it's like a rejuvenated rebuild area where uh -huh. they're not, they're not cleaning and, and, uh, um, uh, rehabbing they're just tear down and build up okay because this was an area world. that wasn't necessarily what i would call affluent in its day mm -hmm. um so this was not this is a box house it wasn't you know grand staircases and all that stuff i mean you know it was it was what are they doing with the it was house? a working you know? family um it's a tear down okay because of the foundation um but it's also six lot it's a, no i'm sorry it's four locks four lots four lots yeah because oh, wow. there's two larger sections in the back where they had two uh, full-size garages than the house, and then they have an empty lot that was next door. Wow. So, yeah. So, it's, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm dying to see that. But here's the thing. We only did the first floor, and I was there for five hours. Are you going back? We have a second floor. We have an attic. We have a basement. So wow. We have, yeah, yeah. And I was honest. That's the other thing, too. I think that, that um, I, I mean, I'm a very vocal person, so my, my net personality doesn't listen to great towards everybody. But um, but I'm also very honest. Like we found like two thousand dollars worth of cash money in that house. I mean, whenever I found it, I was like, hey. Now and a lot of people would just go, yeah, and um, box coins, very valuable coins and stuff. And I think that that's good energy. You know, yeah. you put that out. But I was also pointing out, I'm like, you know, that furniture is going to be worth some money. That glassware is going to be worth something. Like you know, so I put them in touch with my friends who are also in the industry that do other ends of the spectrum and um, was able to save a lot of stuff. So, I mean, that's the part of, I think, for me, is uh, the notion of preservation. And we, we just don't, as a, as a culture now, we don't put a value behind the past. We always, um, looking for the newest, the hottest, and, and, you know, and fast fashion today is just so horrible. It's horrible for What's the fast environment. Fashion? Fast fashion is, is um, if you don't use this, that's fine. H and H and M will sue me. But that's the H and M's and the Top Man and the and you know the the shops of the world. I mean, you go in and pay nine ninety nine for a sweater, Got you're it. getting a nine ninety nine. Because you're going to wear that for the season or the night, yeah. and then get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Or you put it in the closet, or you throw it to donation, and the donation doesn't want it. So I mean, yeah. literally, and clothes today are so synthetically based, it takes decades, if not hundreds of years, for that stuff to break down. Oh wow, I never that's, thought about that. That's why the problem they're having like with all of our landfills because they're say like half of them are full of our discarded garments. And they somebody was Washington Post or whatever said, like if we stopped making clothes right now, we could go 10, 20 plus years and never have to make another garment. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. has too much clothes. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. And Americans, we're, we're probably more guilty than, than most because we think more is better. When we're, whereas like a lot of European countries, and like, especially like in Italy, I mean, those guys aren't, they're clothes horses, but when they get a suit, I mean, that's a suit. They may yeah. have 10 of them, but that un unless their shape changes extremely, I mean, they're going to have those 10. What's well, the beauty get of buying a, a quality garment, right? Yeah. You buy something that's nice. It lasts forever. You don't have to worry about getting something new. Well, like your suit is literally over 40 years old. Yeah. Now, I highly doubt anybody at the office knew. So that's very funny. I got a compliment the first day I wore this, and he thought I just had it made. Yeah. Because I have custom suits, and then I have vintage suits, and I have nothing in between, uh -huh. right? It's all perfectly made for my body and for materials I picked out. Or it's this vintage stuff. I think I bought them all here, actually. Yeah. And the only thing I changed on this one are the buttons. The buttons were dating it a little bit, and I had to take them away. Okay. okay. I know that hurts your Wait, soul. No, but no, but that's actually where I tell a lot of guys that, see, there's three ends to my business. You, which is you want to wear vintage in a modern way, which is why when, you know, you look at it and like, okay, modernize it. We'll taper it a little yeah. bit. Well, you know, maybe adjust the pant. You know, wide belt loops, well, the tailor can shorten those and shrink them and make them smaller we can take the bell bottoms out because i always sell new or old tailoring unless you've tailored it it's really not yours yeah unless of course you've had it made to measure i, I completely agree yeah. i'll buy older stuff and it goes straight to the tailor i do the buttons i do the waist i do the i do whatever i have to mm -hmm. to make it mine right and then it fits and feels beautiful sure sure well and then the quality of that fabric you could get that today but you're really gonna have to go high end because I, I don't even think made to measure even offers like a 200 and up quality of of wool anymore i don't think it's i don't think they even make it because it's just too expensive so what are the levels of wool that i'm i'm not overtly uh, i never really did made to measure when i was in my retail career because i've we never were, stumped you on anything we were made well, well i mean but but the lower you go the cheaper they are i mean okay you, you so got the, 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 the super count? 100s that's that's your thinnest cheapest wool you're going to get and it goes 20 and and so on. But you get into the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. I mean, some of that would could be like 300 plus so grade. So is the lower thick, the thick. number necessarily cheaper or is it just thinner? Cheaper. It is cheaper. Because it's thinner. You know. So, but that's the stuff that's going to, like, have you ever seen a guy with like wrinkles all over his suit and he yes. just sat down? That's cheaper fabric. Okay. The other thing that's different about this suit versus, and I don't know if you did it with your made to measure, is um, I would say anything pre-80s was a canvas suit. Okay. Which means there's an interior, there's a secondary layer of fabric inside your suit that gives it its structure. Where in the, in the 90s, they figured out how to use fusion, where it's like a mesh. They okay. bond it to the top layer of fabric to give it its structure. And what'll happen is, and maybe you've had it happen if you bought a, something off the rack, bubbles. I've seen the wrinkles here before. Uh, that's, that's just construction. That's just construction. Yeah, that's... Okay. that's uh, You've had it cleaned, and then something has shrunk on the interior, and that's caused the the, that's what's the doing binding. That. Yeah, um, but the difference between a few what I call a fuse suit and a canvas suit is night and day. And unless you ask for it today, that's why you can go to certain stores and go out walk and, oh, I got this suit and it's made to measure, and you know, and it's great and it's eight hundred dollars. I'm like, did you was it canvas or was it fused? And like, uh. Uh, and I go. They don't ask any of those questions. They ask so few questions yeah. that if you don't go into when you're working with a custom suit maker, if you don't know what you want, they really are going to take advantage of the situation and just and get you with the. I don't know about take advantage, but they're not going to get. They're not going to ask every question they should, because maybe it's going to increase the cost. And they want to keep you as the clientele. Yeah. yeah right. Because yeah. there's well, so many just, bells and whistles. We've been trained as as Americans, especially our culture. At everything has it's it. it it's everything is price point. And, yeah. and I was seeing when I saw, I used to sell when I was at Neiman Marcus and when I was at Bloomingdale's and I always sold by um, product knowledge. So I was, so I'd have to say, uh, why is this, you know, Xenia for a $5,000 suit? Why is it worth this? Well, it's this kind of construction. And, and of course it's Laura Piana fabric, which is like the, the best house in Italy that ever makes fabric. And, you know, and everything is canvassed and all those stitches are done by hand and the, the welting on the shoulder is done by hand. So, it's that kind of um, thing that I show. And, but I show people that here in my store because I've had that kind of knowledge. That's why you and I are here, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. That's why I've come back so many times because every time I come here, I learn something. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the experience. It's not just about the clothes. You show me something and you explain why this is what it is. Right. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. I still have your Ralph Lauren leather jacket that was yours. Mm -hmm. I love yeah, that piece. I get, I get compliments on that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, lucky only because I got too fat. Because <laughs> that would be in my wardrobe today. But And I've always been looking for one similar or something like that since then, and I haven't been able to find it. I wore it, it yesterday. This yeah. is the perfect break in the weather to wear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I man, that's the thing I, I did. I posted um, 
1948 custom made, uh, what do you call it? Basket weave wool suit um, on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. A gentleman out of Val California, big, huge in the Art Deco Society. He's like, oh my God, I've wanted one of those but forever. I'm like, you know, can you give me the measurements? Got the measurements. And, and so I said, well, I have this Ralph Lauren version and I've just posted on my Instagram. I'm like, here's the 1940s and here's the 80s Ralph. Shows you how good Ralph Lauren technically was really good at reproductions. Now the label has changed a lot and it's, I would say it's last incarnation. I'm not sure like the quality I and mean, even, even in the suits would be there, but um, because now we shop by price point. So yeah. back then, whoever this gentleman was, I mean, he paid quite the hefty sum for those Ralph Lauren pieces because they're all brilliant. And the old blue boxed blue label from Ralph Lauren is now massively collectible okay which makes me feel old because now that means the stuff when it was made when i was in my youth is now considered vintage so <laughs> vintage is anything 100 years and newer it's got to be 100 years and older to be considered an antique okay so now when i sell a 1920 suit now i can literally call it an antique suit because it's literally 100 years old and what's selling right now um in the shop you know or what's on trend for the clothes? Yes. Um, clothes, you know, 60s still hold reign supreme because 60s still has the flat front, narrow leg. The problem with the 60s cut, it was very boxy. Like the shape of the jacket was very square, but usually easy to fix. It's lighter weight fabric. It's a skinnier lapel, maybe sometimes with a notch um, and four season fabric. So even if it's wool, it's meant to be spring, summer, fall, winter. So it, which is four a, season fabric. Okay, that's yeah, cool. Well, yeah. What would something like this be? Oh, that's a fall. Okay. Because it's a, it's considered a tweak. Now yours is what they call the confetti fleck because okay. it's multiple colors and it's just different. That's why I like this. Different thing. tones. Yeah. Confetti fleck. That's what so it is. you can literally pull whatever colors in there out, and you're always going to be on trend. Now you took it very like city stylish and stuff like that, but you throw a fair isle, a, you know, a denim shirt, a fair isle like vest. What's fair isle? Fair isle is um is a design. Okay. It's like a very weekendy. It's a very Irish Scottish. I know what you're talking um, about. Design. Yeah. That and then those with maybe some suede chukka boots versus, and you can make that your country suit versus your city suit. I could see that. Yeah. 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 And versatility is the key too. I mean, that's why I, when I used to sell in, in menswear, I'd be like, okay, here's the shirt, and I'm going to show you two ties that would work with it rather than you only have to wear it this one way. Or here's this one tie, and here's two shirts, you know, to show versatility. I think a lot of people get pigeonholed. They're like, oh, this shirt, this tie, this that. suit, and you can't go outside I, that I box. I definitely get pigeonholed in my outfits. Cause I'm like, I feel like I need more ties for one, but I, I have this one look. It's like the white shirt, and this, I wear this tie with this suit all the time. I feel like it works well. Mm -hmm. And then you look around your wardrobe, you're like, yeah, that doesn't, that looks good, but not as good. So let's just stick with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's comfort level too. I mean, I spend a lot of my time, um, uh, which I always tell people goes into the value of the garment. Like I have a lot of people that are new. I, that's the ends of my spectrum on my business. I have the young guys that are just getting into clothing and then they don't want to wear like everything that's cut for the masses at Macy's. I'm that's like, me. Like, yeah. like $100 suits, $100 suit, let me tell you. And you're going to know it and feel it when you got it on. Because once people put on a vintage, they feel that construction. They feel the canvas. You they can feel the detail. absolutely tell. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that drew me into it too because you try one on and then you go back to something else you have and like you're, you're like this this is solid structure very solid you mm -hmm. feel it yeah. and when you when you're in a cheaper suit you can feel it and you're like i feel like a stitch is going to pop somewhere yeah, yeah, quickly yeah. here i can do whatever i want and nothing's going to happen right i can just tell yep yep now and when that's always I, so I tell people as we were saying before your vintage in a modern way and then i have the vintage what i call the lifestyle that they want it to look like 1940s and they want the spectator shoes and they want the swing tie with the crazy print and then the wide brim fedora and there's a lifestyle and then i also fell into costume okay you know oh, i got a studio 54 party this weekend i need polyester we came here for um for the derby i yeah. came here for the derby with yeah. a bunch of friends that mm -hmm. one time we mm -hmm. all got clothes from here and went straight there this, yeah. was, the, this was the perfect place yeah. for it also another reason why richard's fabulous finds washes and dry cleans all their products because i get so many guys that do exactly that yeah i'll take the tag off and i'll wear it out as, as an example i i bought a the store is now gone but i won't mention names but bought this great belted back jacket so excited changed my outfit gonna wear it that night i'm at four seasons downtown and halfway through the night i'm like <laughs> Like, oh my God, it's like, that's me. And I'm like, I know it ain't my funk. It's the funk because this jacket's dirty. Yeah. And I called the next day and oh, we don't dry clean any of your stuff. I was like, I paid $145 for this jacket. 
I would expect you to spend the six dollars to get it clean. Yeah. And um, so, but he's to say she's out of business. So, oh well. But uh, but but parties, people, entertainment. When 2020 came and everybody, I mean, damn Corona. Ugh. But but between 2020 and 2029, you and you and everybody you know is going to be invited to at least one Roaring Twenties. You know, big uh, absolutely and a prohibition party. I want to throw one. So, so yeah. So I, so I tell guys, I said, get get your three piece pinstripe suit, get your watch chain, you know, get, get your fedora. Um, but also, TV movies have also discovered me. So that's the other end. So costume, vintage in a modern way, and then vintage what I would call vintage lifestyle. Okay. And those are the three round, uh, ends of my business. And then of course I've expanded into decor and, and other stuff. And some weeks that pays the bills. I'm like, hey, but. Yeah, but that's the other thing too, is like, I'm really educational about that stuff too. I'm like, somebody go, oh, it picks up an etched glass and it's a tall stem and it's beautiful. And I go, 1930s. And they're like, oh, what? And I go, yeah. I said, feel that quality. I'm like, tell me you're going to go to, you know, Crate and Barrel and get something like that, you know, and you'll pay less here and you get a much better thing. It just happens to be old. Yeah. Well, and the reason it's lasted so long is because it was better made. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just looking at those glasses, like those look like thicker glass. Which one? Uh, like those up there. The, the goblets? Yes. Yeah. Well, 60s. Yeah, yeah, 60s is about when they got... But actually, believe it or not, the thinner they were, the more valuable they were back in its day because that was you had to be delicate. You had to be careful with it. I would not have wanted to be a maid in that era to save my life because you imagine, oh, you broke that glass, we're taking it out of your check. It would have been a stressful time to be a servant of sorts. Um, but yeah, but that's but all, but that's the other thing. Educate, even when I get tchotchkes and I get, you know, great, you know, barware pieces like this and, and even like the cufflinks and the jewelry i mean everything has a story and i'm always more than happy to whether people want it or not i'm always more than happy to be like by the way let me tell you again product knowledge I, that's that's my favorite thing it's funny you mentioned the the thin glasses someone gave that to me and my wife as a wedding gift we broke all four glasses within two weeks mm -hmm. and it was just light cheers a light cleaning someone just t tipped one over broke I'm like we have the cheapest glasses now, and they're not even wine glasses. They're just like little goblet type things. Because let's just have fun with it. Yeah. Not trying. Yeah. Stop trying to be all formal because it, it was way too much. Yeah, way too much yeah, to handle yeah. those glasses. Right. So where do you end up on those on that spectrum of those three categories, or does it depend on the day? For me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, I well definitely a costume because I mean, I, other than my P. V. Herman suit, which everybody loved. I mean, I've since outgrown that suit, but. Um, I did it once here at the shop, and everybody lost their minds. There were like people were walking by, like, "Hey, Pee Wee," and I. Like, you could pull it off. What's it's the so word funny of the day? when you say that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, but you know, but it's a mix. Like today, and today I look vintage, but technically I love that I'm not jacket. A now this is '90s Ralph Lauren. Okay. Um, but again, if you didn't know any better, you could go into catalogs from the '20s, and you'll pull up exactly this shawl neck with the window pane, with the pockets, and the uh, the patches. So again. As I was saying about vintage inspired, like Ralph does really good vintage inspired. Brooks Brothers, J. Crew, believe it or not, can come, can come up with some good stuff. Every once in a while, a Banana Republic piece will pop up as, as something that looks very um, on the vintage spectrum. But but you got to have an eye. You got to have it well trained. And so, and I pick up those pieces because when, say, uh, somebody came in and they wanted to do, I've got this 20s party I'm going to go to. I said, well, I would say, how extreme you want to go? Because the newsboy with a little sweater vest and a ball cap and a bow tie, or not a ball cap, but a flat cap, will be much more affordable than if I get you in a three-piece. <laughs> That's just funny it's at just all. It just depends upon how, how in-depth you want to go. That's a funny look. Yeah. It'd be cool if you had the old newspapers said, to go with it, too. Newspaper boy or Daddy Warbucks. you got to take your pick. Which one do you want? <laughs> and so how do you find this space? Uh, this, um, oh God, I'm going to make a long story short. Uh, I ended up at, well, I ended up in the hospital. And I was selling online and doing shops and uh, doing pop-ups. And I had always had these people come to me and say, you know, Richard, you really should think about your own space because it was becoming so tedious and, and such work. And I didn't, I didn't think I could afford it. I was like, what a pipe dream and whatever. I ended up sick um, for about a week and um, this close to meet my maker. And I went, you know what? Let's look. Let's just, if it happens, it doesn't, whatever. Yeah. Um, Found a couple of different real estate agents that kept pointing me to Pilsen. And at Pilsen, I just didn't feel it. Though I love Pilsen. I think Pilsen has a great community. There's a great vintage vibe down there. But I just thought for what I wanted to show and what I was going to plan on selling, I just didn't think it was a match. Um, and then uh, the real estate company that I had found were like, you know, we've got this one little weird space way out on North Avenue. And we don't know, you know, and, and we walked, drove up to the building and I just went, 
let the interior be something I can work with, which it technically wasn't. I mean, we had to box everything out. You know, it was all offices and it's really- That's what this was before. Yeah. Um, but in, uh, but here's, speaking of history, 1920, this was a women's millinery hat shop. A what? A millinery. What's a millinery? Women's hat shop. Cloche hats, hats for women. It's called a millinery. Millinery? Yeah. What does that mean? They custom make hats. Custom make hats. Okay. Yeah. They wouldn't be like you walked into an apartment store and pulled it off and like this. Is, so this was a Because that was a business. Yeah. Yeah. And it would have been in that era because you think of the 20s. I mean, every woman wore hats. Every man wore hats. You think hats will Little come back? Kids, I don't think so. I don't think so um, either. Yeah. And well, I think in the European markets, they always will. I'm like, but the second you put on a fedora, they automatically, no matter what you're wearing, you're automatically vintage. And I think it's just be, just because we've gotten lazy and everybody wears sweatpants. But and I don't I know what you do with the hat either. You're walking yeah. around with it and it blows away. And No, that's why you buy the ones that have the little button on the... You ever seen the ones with a string with a button on the side? I've put maybe five of those type hats on my head in my life. Yeah. They called it a wind trolley. And back in the day, you would hook it through your... If it was a windy day, you would put that... You would undo the string, which would then hang, and you'd put it through your lapel hole. No so way. So that if your hat flew off, boom. So you, okay. wouldn't, you wouldn't lose your hat, so... But there used to be met. Ma- ma- the hat's methods. a cool like, idea, and there's still that custom hat maker in the loop, in that old brick building. It's the largest brick building in the world. I yeah, believe. Optimal. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That yeah. place Very is cool. Very expensive. Yeah. What do those cost? But, um, well, it all depends upon what what your hat. I mean, I'm sure they've got basic felts that start at like a hundred and something, and then they go up to you know vacunas that are made. You know, they're a couple thousand dollars. But but you know, for hats and stuff, yeah, I just I, I think we're, we've just kind of moved on from that. I mean, That's a cool. But business. there'll be vintage lifestyle. There'll be people that are going to do it for like TVs and movie companies. This is how I buy them. And 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 again, I mean, it's the daddy warbucks, or you want to be newsboy, and the ones that want to be daddy warbucks always want that lid. So I'm more than happy to to do that for them. So you found the space. So I found the space. Um, negotiated a really really sweet price. Um, negotiated out the white box was what we called it because I said just box it, leave me an office, I'll take care of the bathroom and the kitchenette and whatever, and um, and started moving things in. I uh, I said it was a sign because like at the day I came down to look at the space, I was driving down Western and they had a sign, take a ride on Addison, store closing all fixtures for sale, and I was like I'm gonna stop there on the way home, and I did, and she was like anything you want, just give me a hundred bucks, take it. And so all my wall fixtures, my shelves, my, my round oh, fixtures. that's great. That's the other thing different about my store, I think, than a lot, everything matches. Where a lot of vintage shops are kind of a, are a little, which is fine. That's, that's I mean, part that, of it, that, kind of, That's right? part of the kitsch. Yeah. But mix and match where I'm like, I was like, I didn't want to be that. I mean, when I first opened, because there was such little amount of inventory, people thought it was a new store because they're like, well, oh, what? And I go, oh, no, it's all vintage. But... Um, so we got the lease done. I decided, and then I did all the painting, and I, oh my God, I'll hire, I'll hire somebody next time. That was a lot of work. I mean, but in the end, um, and the first year was tough because the neighborhood was really still in a rough state in this, this area. This neighborhood. So when did you open? Uh, 2013. Okay, my mom grew up on the 3300 no, block. I take that back. 2014. 2014. 2014. Yeah, yeah. My mom grew up on the 3300 block of Beach. And they talk about how much this neighborhood has changed. This neighborhood has changed dramatically in 15 years, even 10 years. Mm-hmm. Like, it's unreal. There's the apartment building that was built right over here that uh, we leased up. Mm-hmm. And you just see this whole block. And you still see there's so much more to happen, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we were talking about this off offline before. Like, I think the next 10 years here, you're going to see a lot of this right here in this neighborhood really go. Well, in the 1920s, um, all the way up through the 50s, this was the West North Businessmen's Association. I was able to go onto the Chicago Tribune's okay. website and find an original advertisement for here. That's how I found out it was a millinery. That's cool. In 1928, this was a bakery, believe okay. it or not. Next door was a restaurant. Uh, Bicker Dyke was actually a, also an Italian restaurant. This across the street was a, a manufacturer for furniture and showroom. Um, this next door, Queen's Theater, 1910 to 1952. They used to show... Can you imagine they started For in 42 years? There was a theater? Black and whites, and then they probably went to talkies, and then they went to color, and then, and then, and around the 50s and the 60s, especially, is when a lot of this, because of the, the, the riots and everything mm-hmm. that happened. So that's when this area kind of started and is down. And now, when I moved to Chicago in 95, uh uh-uh, uh, no, 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 this part yeah. of town, ooh. but um, there were still car fires. Yeah. And for me, I went where I felt an energy because I do believe in that. And, and just something about this area spoke to me. And, and when we got in here and I saw, okay, it was the right amount of space. It was the right price. Um, you know, and then I looked at online and I went, okay, what's, what's, and this part you'll love. I'm like, okay, what, what are, 
what what is what's the improvement in the value of of buildings and, and homes and it was see it was a gradual tick where I, I personally think and you don't have to use this um i thought logan was a blow up yeah. like all of a sudden boom and that's never good in my eyes because how do you know if that's going to sustain well it's going to price everyone out too yeah so here it's always been kind of like a gradual so i knew that i'm like so after my first year i stopped you know reduced a lot of my online selling and started concentrating more on the store and then by year two i'd say by year three that was like then no online st store supporting itself foot traffic was really improving uh, my neighbor was finally cleaning up his spaces because that's the first thing he bitched at me about when I, we took the paper down off the windows after i'd said everything in here and he was like uh, now you're gonna have to make me clean up all of my spots because literally chicken wire and, and duct tape on the windows next door for real i mean this was so scary um and uh and so now, and he's cleaned them up a bit, you know, I mean, it, but I think the problem you know, we have over here is there's a lot of holdouts. Like that gentleman yeah. owns like seven spots on this block and he won't let him go. And he's in his seventies and he's had a heart attack. It's like, dude, wow, okay. you know, I would sell seven properties. You figure even if he gets like 400,000 a pop, I mean, you could retire on that yeah, and go live have some nice. fun in your life. I never understand that. When yeah. you get that old, you need to actually take advantage of everything you've built. Yeah. This isn't fun unless you spend the money. Right, right. The whole process is is hard. Well, too. which holds it back from improvements. I mean, it holds it back from, you know, people that that because I would say food and having connected businesses, you park and then you spend your time. Where right now I'm still like that. We park, we come to your shop, and then we leave. And that's exactly what happens. I hate that part. Yeah. I really, really do. I and, come, I come to this area for you and i do things west of here and i do things east of here but in this two three block range there's not much there's nothing i do yeah yeah well we have the community center across the street and there was talk that that was going to go away but that unfortunately stayed i said so you know it's going to sound horrible they say but we i get the poor and the crazy across the street um and then we have a we have a marketing place we've got the you know the nail salon that's not bringing any business over here uh metro that does nothing. Um, T-shirt shop, that does nothing. So really, so like a, a real brick and mortar walk-in business business, I really am the only one, especially on this block. You go to the next block, I I don't think you really do either. I mean, the block where the building no. that you leased There's out. There's nothing I mean, over there. Yeah, you know, you've got Cuban Fusion, which is really great, which I How's send- food there? I haven't been there yet. I send everybody there. because it's, it's really, really, it's good. really good. And it's, you know, vanilla plain as my palate is growing up in the Midwest. You know, meat and eggs and bread, and, and that's about it. Um, I can find things to eat there, and that, so okay. that's always brilliant. But uh, but I, I think that's part of it too. It's like restaurants bring people. The Barbaro there is like really brilliant. But unfortunately, COVID came and just really put the brakes on everything going on over here. Yeah. And and I just went online. I started hustling a little more, a little more online posts, a little more you know directives you know, internet working with people and stuff. Facebook boards are really great. Marketplace is really great. I was trying to find other places to, to show my business. And yeah. that's, and that really has, you know, helped me all the way through that. And I did take a PPP, so, but it was this much. What gets this the most much. traction in your store? As far as? Is there any one item or type of item that sells more than anything? Well, the clothes are definitely the core. But is it is it suits over jackets? Is it sweaters over? Is it shirts? Suits. suits. It's definitely suits. Okay. Because I think a lot of guys they go into a store and then they see it's all just solid. There's no color. There, well, there's a little bit of color now, but not as much. Um, but it's all solid. There's no detail. It, you know, the the fabrics are just inexpensive and gross. And for what they're going to spend on that, I mean, I mean, most people would balk at coming in here and spending one hundred fifty dollars on a used suit i said but yeah i said or that suit he could have bought it and wore it for one special event and put it in the closet used and never wore is, it again. used is so funny like yeah. for clothes well i've bought a number of things secondhand that had the tags on them yeah you know some people buy things that don't wear them again especially women's clothing yeah 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 but um i don't run across that unfortunately not not too much though i did did just get a stack of 1950s dead stock bowling shirts still in the box that um that dig that i was telling you about on armitage uh -huh. Uh, yeah, it was brilliant. So, of course, and then e the eBay machine. Ch -ch -ch. I was like, what? So, yeah. You need a counter, a female counterpart. Well, you know, my biggest thing is like I have major control issues and I would want everything to be under my eye. But what if it was just um, next door? Like if you could find no, someone think that to do it, that. I think it would be brilliant. But Chuck owns that building and Chuck does not letting any of these go. So that there lies the rub. I mean, this one is now probably so dilapidated because you can smell it. 
when you could smell a building from my apartment when I've got my door open in the summertime, you know that you know there's a lot of dry rot. Or there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> that's a sign of a lot of wood rot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you can you smell know, it, you can smell it. Smelling anything is not a good sign. Exactly. And, and the rat infestation over there has got to be outrageous because he, uh, he your does, neighbors are going to love you. I hope they don't ever see this. Right. It's all right. But uh, but but I tell the truth. I'm like, you know, the reality well, is, right. and th is like the reality that the reason this block hasn't really taken off is because, you know, you have certain people from the old school that are holding out. But Chuck's was here was here before it went down. I mean, he's been here for 45 years. I never understood that. But, I mean, but then again, paid I'm 30, 40 grand for these buildings. If that. <clears throat> oh, that's what. Yeah, that's what he told me. Yeah. I mean, this building in 1989 was listed at eighty five thousand dollars. Yeah. But this was the hood. This was this was the and for that era, bad, bad that actually sounds town. expensive. Yeah, for eight, well, that for was three floors though, four apartments plus Still, first. Yeah, eighty nine grand or what was it? Eight, 19, uh, 1985. 80, 85, 80, 89 grand. Yeah, I think that's actually expensive for the era. Yeah, isn't that funny? I met someone who bought a home in in Lincoln Park on Dayton Street. I think they paid eighty grand for it, and they're like, "We overpaid. You know, we overpaid so much." I'm like, wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah Sometimes yeah. it makes sense to overpay because you never know where it's going to go. Exactly. Exactly. But but, me, but but I think also the problem I have too is like knowing that I've been in a lot of these spaces, like how as an owner you could let your business, your, uh, did get dilapidated like that. You've got leaks literally just coming out of the ceiling and your cure is a tarp in a bucket. I'm like, I never understood that. So um, that's probably why I'll always be a renter and I'll probably never own a property because every dollar I would get in, I would do probably doing just things to make it better and yeah. structurally sound and, and improvements. And that's why I'm, believe it or not, I'm actually thrilled with my new land, new owner of the building because he's going to take the time and the money to actually do, of course, I found him a big chunk of money, so we won't go into that. But um, Go into that. That's cool because this yeah. whole space is going to change. You told me that and I was like, maybe we should have waited, but no, we yeah. do it. We do it well, now. no, you'll, you can come and do a, like an after shot. I'm like, and here's yeah. Richard's after, you know, I mean, depending upon when this launches or how soon we're going to get this done. But, you know, but the city of Chicago has a lot of great uh, tiffs and a lot of great, you know, small business uh, help out there. And had I not known about this, this small business improvement fund, my landlord would not have gotten a hundred thousand dollars worth of TIF money to make improvements to to um, redo the shop, and stuff. And it's not being redone at my request by any means, because this money is not for improvement beautification. It's not for that. It's not for oh, I want to put carpet down and I want to change some light fixtures. That's not what this is for. This is for literally structural and um, physical improvements to the okay. property. So you had to prove that. And ah, so that's huge. And then so many people on this block could use it. Did Chuck apply for any of that? I told him all about it. And so that's what I'm saying. Could mind, have a hundred grand per property. Mind blown. Yeah. 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 But it also means that the that the city's gonna come in and they're gonna look at it and yeah. they're gonna go, okay, there's a lot more fix than a hundred thousand. Yeah, exactly. So again, I think it's that that that's that old school mentality, that old like because he still thinks this is the hood. I'm like, yeah. this is not the hood anymore. This is definitely an up and coming area. Um uh, uh you know, the gentrification is is always such a touch, touchy subject um, but as i t i tell friends of mine and even somebody that came in and asked me about it once they said i'm the only all vintage menswear shop in in all of illinois that for a fact i know and from what i've been told i might be the only one tailored clothing across the united states so i didn't take anything from the neighborhood i added yeah and i think there that to me is where where those aspects flip gentrification is funny because you need it on some levels, you know, like calling you, gen you coming here is not gentrifying the neighborhood. You didn't buy the building. You didn't push anyone out. You just came here with your shop and you added to the neighborhood just well, like you said. And this sat vacant for three years before I took it. Yeah. So, and they always say, you know, value never goes up when a bunch of places have, you know, paper on the windows. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, when I got here seven years ago, this didn't look like a bomb zone. It was, I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking. I mean, uh, duct tape and chicken wire and cardboard box on the wall windows and stuff like that to block anybody from seeing what was inside and um and so yeah so that's like so i told people i said i said i came here first and everybody's now following me but <laughs> but i felt the energy and I, and again and i looked at the at you know taxes and I'm like look what's the property values what was what was improving um you know would i be near a demographic that would get or understand or want my product and that's why i think what i sell vintage suits hats and ties i don't think would have worked in pilsen but i definitely think it works because i'm so close to wicker park you're smack dab in the middle here because yeah. you're close to logan logan wicker wicker humble 
Yep. Bucktown, maybe sort of. Yep. You have everything all around here that yep. really yep. fits in. And online media, I will have to say that that's the biggest the biggest thing I, t I tell people all the time, you know, when other small businesses complain, oh, I'm so slow. No, so slow. I said, why aren't you Instagramming? Why aren't you Facebooking? Yeah. You know, why don't you throw something up a marketplace? Maybe you take a hit on it, but you know, it gets gets the gets the the feed out there. And, yeah. And so, yeah, it's one of those. You know, you gotta you gotta you gotta have angles and angles. And then of course for me another great uh, thing about this space, which is why I love it here at my two car garage, which keeps my car and then my my vintage car, which I think is, you've seen before, I right? right? Which you I love. Have. I love that car. And uh, my '64 Rambler, and then. Um, and then the patio area, which I host events and parties and stuff through Peer Space, and that's another great source of income. But the other thing too is like a lot of people thought it was all about the money. I said technically no, it's all about you got to walk through my store to get to that patio. <laughs> and how could you walk through all of this gloriousness? Not look at anything. And not stop. And almost yeah. every party and event that I've had, somebody's always bought something. I believe so, that. Yeah. Have you always lived upstairs? No, no. No. I did that out of necessity <laughs> because um, uh, speaking to the conditions of the building, which this small business improvement fund is going to fix um, is the, the previous construction of the building was done in the 90s and done really, really cheap. So the pipes have frozen and burst okay. every year. And this is the first year I'll be that the pipes did not burst. First year. First year? First the year, whole time you've been here? Every year that I've been here, the pipes have always frozen and burst, which means the water comes down to here, yeah. which means I have to pull you my- ruined your clothes. My apartment, well, and I have my emergency tarps in the back, because okay. so I, I, I heard the first time I hear the tick, 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 I know exactly where it's gonna go, and I go, but anyway. Um, so yeah, we, uh, I lost my train of thought on that. Space, living upstairs, yeah, li the parties. And living upstairs became a necessity because I had to be here just in case something would happen. And, and it multiple times, had I not been here, and I but I was still living in Rogers Park, I would have known, wouldn't have known something was going on and literally things would have been ruined. I mean, I'll give you a quick story. Uh, three years ago, three or, three or four years ago, uh, Chris, day after Christmas, um, I wasn't living in the building, so it'd been four years ago. Um, I wasn't living in the building. I decided on the day after Christmas because we had snow. I would come home from my families in Wisconsin and came home. So I thought a oh, day after Christmas, like, eh, I'll go in, I'll open. I might not have any business, but just better than sitting at home doing nothing. Maybe I'll have some stragglers in. And the pipe burst upstairs. And nobody was living in the space at the time. And had I not been here when that happened, how long would that have gone on? Yeah. Because there was nobody upstairs to say Especially anything about holiday. it. Yeah. And nobody was down here to catch it when it happens. Now I know how to pop the, the, the only way to turn out the water to this building is through a little manhole in this in the 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 sidewalk. Yeah. yeah, There's no interior way to turn it off. Okay. So I was able to turn it off and, but it was still a nightmare because, oh my God, I mean, that was gallons and gallons of water. So that's the reason I took the apartment upstairs. I mean, and I made it adorable. You've seen the pictures. Yeah. It, it turned out really cute. Yeah, it looks great. It was a horrible little box to get started with because again, 90s, 90s oak wood cabinets, 90s white tile floors, really dated, gross. Those, uh, uh, God, I hate them more than anything. Chrome, gold, nipple fixtures. Why, and anybody thought that those were, were great. But again, but speaks to the age. Yeah. I mean, you could usually date a place by sometimes, a lot of times by the fixtures. Yes. So. So I spent a lot of my own money to redoing things and you know, I made it my way. So but sometimes you gotta do that. You gotta spend your own money to make it how you like it. And it was worth it to me because I figured as long as I'm here, I'm probably gonna be up there, so why not? It makes a lot of sense, especially if you can get a good deal on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And for anybody curious, that looks like this. Because <laughs> it's the same color walls and it's the same red accents and you know, what works, works. It, it's classic, never dies. It's a very cute place from the pictures I've seen. Thank you, thank you. So did you say you're moving into a mall after this? Well, I'm looking at um, pot, you know uh, vintage malls. Okay. You know they have booths. What's that? Uh, it's uh, so it would say like, like a, Logan. Well, no, like a Broadway Antique Market, Edgewater Antique Market. Um, so there's like a large space. They usually give you a ten by ten, which is rental, and then you put your product in there. And then they have a cashier that rings and you know. Okay, I've seen those in like Lake Geneva and other places when they have them for antique stuff, or they're yeah. just like 
here's all of it. It's one big box type of place, and yeah. then you get your own little space, and then yeah. you don't have to man it. They just take a piece of it. Right. And then you right. can't negotiate, which kind of sucks. Yeah. I think that's great. <laughs> I think that's right. But, but they also have habitually have all store sales. So at some point, yeah, you're going to get a bump. But I, there's all this, like, I love to collect pottery. I love vintage glass. Um, at, so, so sorry, sorry to interrupt you. When they do that, do you do you pay a p do you pay a monthly fee to be in that space or yes. do you just pay a percentage you both both yeah okay. it's a small percentage but you do pay a small percentage and then you pay your booth rent and what is some what does a booth rent cost uh you know a few hundred uh, three to four okay depending um just enough to get you in there and not enough to make you you know not interested in it well my whole thing is i'm paying four hundred dollars four hundred fifty dollars a month to be to have a studio space which i'm not utilizing because of the lockdown and um, that because I was going to use that as a show space. Okay. So at least at this, I'll have a spot where my stuff will be out in the open, available for sale. So it's like, so I'm going to pay all that money to have that just stuff sitting there collecting dust that nobody sees it, or pay that money to have it somewhere. Got it. And again, with my merchandising skills and my, I personally think with my my taste level, that um, I would rock it. Because there's so many other things that I can't bring into this shop. I can't bring in floral tea towels. I can't bring in, you know, 1920s Mexican print pottery. Because I, I, it doesn't match the vibe of what my store is. Yeah. And so that's going to give me another great way to expand. Well, expand my bit shopping, uh, you know, what I can buy. But also, um, you know, gives me a, a new something, you know. Is that how you look at this? When you see things that you can't sell here, you try yeah. to find another outlet of where you can do it because well, you know those what, things will move? Well, that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Because, you know, that's the thing with, with the vintage market. You know, you can't be all things to all people. Yeah. And if I started introducing floral tablecloths and, and girly looking, you know, co- you know, uh, decor, guy, people are going to go, uh, and then, so, and you alienate your mail base, which is really we what we were talking about that it. before before we got online. Yeah, like some some people really overdo it, try to put their personal touch on the place in a bad way, yeah. like whoever they are making that shown on the walls. Yeah, yeah, but it's also but it also kind of gets my creative juices flowing. Like I I spent yesterday I left at ten, I didn't get home until seven thirty, and I was because you have to really spend the time in in the, the places where you source your inventory. Yeah. Because you know, you, know, you got to Google it, flash, you know, eBay it. Da-da, okay, you know. I mean, so you, when you're and it's all, but I love learning new things. I mean, I'm always still learning about the menswear, but I kind of like after all these years, I kind of got that down on a click. Whereas now with the pottery and the decor stuff, that gives me a new, oh, it's something new to keep the wheels. That's why turning. it's stimulating. Yeah, yeah. So it's stimulating. Yeah, I mean, because I love. I mean, there was like, and well, I just I want to know to also to why certain pieces say something to me. I, I like the, there was a piece yesterday. That I looked at and I was like, oh, it's kind of, oh, it's heavy as hell. It's kind of dark pottery. I'm like, I didn't, I said, but what, what about it this is? So, you know, Google Lens. You ever heard, use yeah, Google yeah, Lens? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Yeah, you point it, click, and it searches the internet. Oh, my God. It's like a 1920s, a very expensive 1920s uh, pottery piece. And if you looked at it, you were like, oh, that's not Art Deco. Yeah, but there was that, not everything was Art Deco in the 20s. There was also another uh, whole areas of, of pottery and things. But now I want to learn, okay, what style manner was this made? What was it made out of, you know, who might have this have been? Because it's signed, I don't know how to read it. Okay. Again, learning. It's, it's, a, it's a new, so it's, it's some, and it's fun and I love, to, I love to do it. I mean, I literally filled my entire car yesterday with glass and figures and, and uh, pottery and. And, uh, and where was all that from? It's like, uh, so it's like. Because I mean, I not to say they don't know what they have, but I, but I think a lot of people look at that like, and go, "Oh, it's that's too fancy." It doesn't like, matter what. Like no one knows what that stuff is. Yeah, you see it, and you're like, "It's just old." Yeah, just toss yeah. it. Yeah, easier. Yeah. yeah. Well, as an example, though, I picked up this little piece of, and most people would just look at it and go, mm, "Okay, whatever." And it's a little Dutch girl with her little Dutch hat, and she's got her little water bottles. But next to it is a little um, Dutch windmill. But the windmill thing spins, and you go on eBay. That's like a thirty dollar piece. Okay. Now, I picked it up for sixty cents, <laughs> but you got to have the eye because yeah. I mean anybody else could walk in there and go, "Oh, I'm going to pull all the visa and I'm going to know." Duh, duh. And it's Delft and it's you know made in the fifties and Delft. It's Delft is a, a, a company that made pottery. Okay. And they made figurines and they did a lot of 
uh, a lot of blue and white, blue and white, but Dutch blue and white because there was Dutch blue and white and then there was English blue and white and then you have uh, Japanese or Asian blue and white. So there was a lot of different part because when it became popular, everybody wanted to do it. You know, you know, see what I'm saying? So yeah, so I don't know. Uh, but I just, I love learning new stuff. I picked up a piece of Limoges yesterday. What's that? Limoges, full, 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 Italy, big bucks, fancy, <laughs> fancy. Well, no. Is it like a figurine? Is it some, a statue or what is it? Plate. It was a platter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, most people look at it and go, it's floral and it's got the gold trim on it and stuff like that. I said, but I knew looking at it, I was like, uh, 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 and then I flipped it and I was like, ah, ah, Limoges, into the cart. No chips, no cracks, no, da, da. that's other thing too, condition. That's what takes so long. Honestly, you got to pick up stuff and you got to literally run it across your hands. You got to hold it up to the light. Close to, I mean, that's the other thing. Close too. especially. Yeah, you got to turn them inside out, make sure Stains nobody didn't know and... nasty in it. You know, <laughs> certain things that can be laundered, washed, cleaned. You know, I mean, I can overlook a underarm stains to the liner. That's just the, the nature of the beast. But mm -hmm. yeah, anyway. <laughs> so what's next after this? Well, my friend, I've got so much on my plate. I've, I've yeah, got, I've got know, the patios. Like I've it. got the now. I'm going to have the booth, and then I've got and I've got the shop. So, so let's talk yeah. about the back. So you yeah. do events. What type of events have you had back there? I've had uh, a lady's true English tea. A woman that was she didn't come from England, but she's from England, and they did a lady. It was like a, a a baby shower, but not baby shower. It was literally like an English tea, and she had the little great little tea sandwiches, the gloves and everything. The gloves and everything. Yeah, it okay. was absolutely brilliant. I did a, a full Jewish wedding with the mm -hmm. chuppah, with the lights and the whole breaking the glass and stuff like that. I've done, I mean, just general birthday parties. Uh, uh, so, you know, but it's such a small, great space. It's seat 16. Um, Very intimate. Intimate. It's not overly expensive. You know, you could get the, the decor package, which would then get you get you the real sham glass champagne flutes. Somebody shows up with paper plates and plastic cups and I go, Phew. I said, so for $95, you could get everything staged and then you could come and you know all you got to do is bring the booze and the food. And then you leave. And then you leave and then That's I take nice. care of it. So yeah. for me, I'm like, I, to me, it's a no-brainer. But again, people are really, you know, if they're conscious of their budgets. But, um, and we up, I upgraded this year because while I'm doing shopping for the booth, I'm also looking for, for pieces. The only problem is when I'm shopping, is I was buying stuff for the booth, it turns out that, or the patio, all this stuff, I was like, these little um, carafes, you know what a carafe is? Yeah, yeah. for water or yeah. whatever. A little bulbous on the bottom, a little fluted, have these uh, great little dot etched all the way around. Yeah, turns out they're 1950s, they're worth like 12 a piece. I'm like, well, I can't put those on with me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my other problem. My eye is drawing me into certain things and then when I go to uh, think, oh yeah, I'll just put them on the patio. Like I can't put those spode plates out there. I mean, they're 25, 35 each still. So. But we're going to stage it. We're going to professionally photograph it. We're going to like do a couple of different incarnations. That's cool. So I can really upgrade my listing on Pure Space because that's the, that's the thing. But it's a great money maker. It truly is. I mean, people could come in, they experience it. I think what I love more than anything, is the, um, oh, I can't believe this is in this side of town. I get that. Are we still in Humboldt Park? I was like, so we still have a connotation. Well, Humboldt it's, isn't it's Humboldt it. anymore, but not everyone knows that. Yeah. You, have, you really have to live in the city to figure that out. Yeah. So let's start with yeah. that ring. Oh, this is a reproduction. Yeah? Yeah, I absolutely love. I was trying to find a vendor online. I ordered this from a company um, through uh, 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 Etsy. And um, they do jewelry. I just, I couldn't get it at a, at a margin. Because what I could buy it for, for me personally, I was like, oh, that's a really great deal. But then I was like, to sell. well, if I ordered a quantity... And and there was no there was no uh, sticker adjustment. But this this is a this is a version of many many vintage uh, men's rings I've seen from the era. And that so I ended up buying like the stainless steel, the ones that are not necessarily the quality that I would love, but the lion head. It, that era for some reason, because um, everybody thinks of a mobster, they always think of the pinky ring. Yeah. So a lot of people. So I ordered a lot of these stainless steel versions of that would be come in at affordable at twenty to twenty five because then it was. You know, hey, you lose it. You only spent 20 bucks on it. I mean, this would be like a $125 ring. Okay. But I, I could not bring it in at that price point in the shop. But it wouldn't but move. I did discover in a collection that uh, I bought, because um, it was so lightweight, and I was like, uh, it's just like one of those plain gold gold-plated signet rings. And my dumbass didn't even look. And I got out my jeweler's thing the other day, and it turns out, yeah, it's 18 karat gold. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just a very lightweight ring. Little did I know. I was just going to throw it, 
put a $25 tag on it and throw it in the bucket. Thank God I looked. So I dug through all my other rings and I was like, oh, what crap? What else did I miss? <laughs> but, you know, but again, it's learning curve. That's the one thing I will have to say, though, after all these years that it just, that does not interest me at all. Watches, you know. Why not? And jewelry. I love watches. It just, and I have no. And cufflinks. It's the only type of men's well, jewelry I care about. Well, and, you know, and for the costume jewelry, absolutely. I mean, the, price, po- the profit margin is really good. Um, you know, it, it's not overly priced for the area that I'm in or what people would go into a vintage shop and expect. Um, yeah, no one's going to come here and buy a watch probably for the price at point it would be. Exactly. That makes sense. Because like the one watch that I had, I ended up keeping it. I mean, it turns out it was like a solid gold uh, Curvex Gruen. 1930s somebody put it some dummy put it on a 1970s stretch band which was a big mistake because i even thought it was 70s i thought eh, that's part of the clearance table i'm like i'll just throw it in the bag and then i get it here and it turns out it's solid gold and it's worth 800 dollars. kept it but um but i could never put it in the case for that price and let the neighborhood get out that i've got real golden garments <laughs> in here i'm like oh my god i'd be like the shop will be gone e- yeah so you know yeah what are some of your favorite things. places in chicago places you frequent a lot uh, as a buyer? As anything. You just You like to eat? You like to visit? Uh, you know, I'm so local. It's going to say it's, well, or maybe it's not weird. I mean, you know, my world really revolves around my business. I yeah. mean, and like I live in a building. When I traded in my car to buy the Mercedes, it was so funny because he was like, you only put 4,000 miles on this car in four years. And I was like, I don't go anywhere, dude. I'm like, and when I travel bit, 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 bit around Chicago, I mean, you're not putting big mileage on it. Um I've put more on the car I have now because I've been branching out into up to Wisconsin to source and south, south side and and far west burbs to, uh, you know, because those are there's other a whole bunch of other vintage people picking in Chicago. I like to go to where. Yeah. uh, What's that community like? You know, my anticipation going coming into this business that it wasn't going to be like when I worked at Neiman Marcus and Straight Commission, where it was cutthroat, backstab, you know, return and put under their own number you you spent so much time worrying about the other guy that you'd really couldn't concentrate on what you were doing it was that bad and it was that bad yeah i'll never work in a straight commission environment and the other problem i have the man my world but the management almost encouraged it they liked that kind of cutthroat oh yeah they want that animalistic behavior yeah and i and i couldn't deal with it in fact i tell people i said working at neiman's great learning experience i could spot an armani and i can spot a zenia and i could spot a stefano ricci from around the block, I was like, yeah, this is a $250 tie. Of course, I'm going to pick it up at the, that's a thrift for a dollar. <laughs> um, of course, I don't have, I can't put that kind of margin on it when I sell it, but I'm still going to, but I'm going to tell like somebody like you, I would yeah. go, oh, I got a 30 I love vintage ties. I got a $35 rack of Brioni's over there, man. What do you want? I'm like, oh, the $200 tie. Exactly. Um, but doing that straight commission environment, I'll, you know, drove me into therapy. It really did. I mean, it was so stressful every day. I mean, I always tell people, when you have bad dreams about having to go to work the next day, you know, you know. When you, Adam's when, laughing back there like that, like that's him for here. Yeah. And I'm like, oh no, is that, is that what I'm causing for when, Adam? <laughs> when, you clock, when you clock in and you don't want to have to do it until the minute you have to do it, you don't like your job. And um not that I wasn't good at it. Well, now you're the opposite. You never clock in. You're always working, but yep. you love it. Well, that's a, and it truly is. People are like, "What's your off day?" It's like, "Oh, please." What I'm off like, day? Yeah, yeah. grow uh, not grocery store. Um, like I, those packages today, I missed my mailman, but that's all right. Um, so I got. I'll have to run those to the post office tonight. Um, you know, dry cleaning. A lot of I'm constant. They're once a week, at least once a week. Uh, sourcing. I mean, the thing about it is like. Because people are like, oh, you don't always have to go. I said, yeah, but you never know when that wow piece is going to be there. As an example of something that I bought yesterday, again, just popped in my head. I'd seen it before on um, many other blogs. Uh, and I was just like, oh, my God, it's one of those large uh, ceramic. And it's, but it's a Pekingese dog, not knowing it's literally like 60 plus years old. And... Gotta love Humble Park. Yeah, yeah. Gotta love love your do-rag, girl. Anyway, um, so I was like, what's, oh, I've seen that before. Show me that, show me that, show me that. She brings it out. And of course I did my, and I was like, eh, it's a $150 ceramic. Now anybody else would look at it and go, eh, it's just a dog. You gotta, you gotta, and that's, I'm training my eye now. There's something, there's my weird sixth sense that's always drawn me into all this stuff as we talked about earlier. I think it was all those, 
days at my great grandma's house digging through the old because my great grandma never threw anything away. She still had stuff from the twenties. I mean, okay. she had cards and flowers and uh, uh, hankies and all this. I just I loved, loved, loved going to her house. I don't know whatever happened to the house, but. Um, yeah, it's just so my love of vintage just has always given me an infinite eye to just kind of gravitate. And I always and I love to go to the other malls. You know, you go to those antique malls and it kind of also is a great train. You know, so you could kind of like when you see go. that, when you see your competition, do you see it as competition? Do you guys have good camaraderie? Do you see each other at the same places? What's that like? I think it depends on where you've kind of honed in your skills like Again, menswear really is ignored, not a totally ignored, but here in Chicago, I've kind of really got the market. I mean, most places will have a little something for the guys, but that's what drives guys nuts. They hate going into like, like when you go to J. Crew, J. Crew, even like you think of it, I don't, I always thought of this kind of like having a really great menswear line. But when you go to the store, here's 80% of it's the women's and the guys get the far back corner by the dressing rooms. That's why it's where it's That's everything when it's men's. Yeah, you're like, you're walking to this whole place and there's this corner for you. And, and like, I get okay. it. The and, women, it's all, and it's upstairs or in the basement or yeah. wherever it is. And I get it. The women do most of the spending. 80% of, of, of shopping is done by women. Okay. But guys don't always like having to feel like the, the poor stepchild put in the back in the corner. Yeah. So that was the other notion. Men of like a opening. place for them. Yeah. That's why men go to barber shops. That's why men smoke cigars. That's why men drink. Like <clears throat> you want a space that feels like it was made for a man, just like a woman wants to go to the salon or get her nails done or whatever that is. It's an environment made for you. Right. I've gotten right. my nails done, go with my wife and like little fun thing to do, but like, I don't feel natural there. I, I do it for her so we can spend some time yeah, together. Yeah. She comes here. Plus, and, plus, and your feet aren't all cracked up. Which, that's true. Which, which is they take a, that scraper thing, and oh, I have like layers and layers of skin. It was yeah, disgusting, yeah, but it yeah. felt good afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you got to continually do it. That's the catch. You <laughs> I know? think I've done that once. Yeah, no, no, no. You got to do that. I just see Rachel's nails across the street, and the guy, <laughs> I go, but you know, but they were smart about what they did with their PPP money. I mean, their their landlord, their owner of their building, they got the money. So he came down and he negotiated, and then he went in, all new floors, walls, new lights. I mean, he went in and, awesome. and, and he redid the facade. Uh, he might have gotten the TIF. No, he wouldn't have gotten the TIF money because that was new. So he took his PPP and then he actually reinvested it in his building. Good. And I think that's always going to be the fight between owners and tenants. Yeah. Well, uh, that will always be I know people that got PPP money, over a million dollars of PPP money. Their business went up. They did not need that money. They're like, I won the lottery. Yeah. And they'll never have to return that. Yeah. yeah. It's not a lot. Well, the newest one is going to go, what is it going to be? 20? You have to have 20 or less employees. Employees, that's what I heard. And sole proprietors are going to be moved to the front of the line. I'm yeah. like, well, the last one was now, a loan Now, a loan at 0% interest, but how much of that is going to be forgivable? And that's my whole thing. I mean, mine was 100% forgivable. Yeah, mine was only 50. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but again, it also goes into how much are you paying for rent? How much, you know? Yeah. yeah and all that stuff. And, and it, and it turns out it's just because my finance, my uh, at that that time, my income versus what I was paying for rent and expenses were, they didn't jive. Okay. Yeah, you know, made me look like I made too much. I said, well, on paper, yeah. I said, but you're not in here, you know, having to deal with with the daily. So again, I'm I'm working all the time. Yeah. So if I had to pay myself twenty five an hour, which I would, because I'm well worth twenty five an hour, but probably more. But um. You know, you, that's that's the that's that's where the balance lies. Yeah. So when you're finding these clothes, how far do you often have to go out for them? Where are you sourcing this stuff? I go up to Wisconsin. I go out to the far west suburbs. I go to the deep south side. Um, I was to say for clothes, that's not a thrift store kind of thing. Okay. Um, that's definitely a, usually private appointment, um, estate sale uh, kind of deal because to get the quality. So are you looking for estate sales? Is the yeah, yeah. Okay. Where but I would have those? to say the last two years, I mean, I just like the woman on Walcott, I got a call, you know, cool. hey, ch -ch -ch, hey, ch -ch -ch. Um, yeah. And that's really kind of how a lot of that works. Um, and I do follow the estate sales. But again, a lot of the estate sales, run, one funny story, I went to one and I was just like in her bedroom and it's all, it's all the stuff's pulled out and it's all laid out on the bed. And then I went into this next room and it's nothing. And I was like, that was his bedroom. What'd you do with that stuff? Oh, nobody ever wants the men's stuff. We just we just got rid of it. And I was like, are you kidding my card? Please, God, don't ever do that again. Because I think a lot of people don't put any intrinsic value. And But again, just like women do 80% of the shopping, women are usually doing the ones that are yeah, buying. that makes sense. When it comes to the clothing end of it. So the men's wear usually gets ignored. And a lot of times, yeah, they get, it costs estate sale people the money to get rid of that stuff in the end. Yeah. So, you know, 
they have to look at their profit margin. And this is like my card. I, I've given my card to every estate sale person. I'll come early before the sale. I said, I'll pay a little bit more. I don't care. I don't want to have to elbow people. I hate that, the whole crush. Yeah. I mean, not that there aren't other dealers that do vintage in Chicago that do vintage menswear, but they're looking for other stuff, not what I look for. Okay, so yeah. what are they looking for? What's they're the looking for rock t-shirts and they're looking for jeans. Yes. So they're looking for uh, Western wear. They're looking for rockabilly. They're, um, what is like, rockabilly? Like, like the bowling shirts, like the okay. bowling shirts. Right? Like, yeah, I was like, there's a guy on um, uh, Milwaukee right now who's closed because again, building problems with his space um, that, uh, he he would have lost his mind opening a box with dead stock, never worn, never used bowling shirts in them from the 1950s. He really he'd have lost his lid because he comes in here scoping me out because he's got the big, but he's got his clientele base that he'll pay whatever I've got marked because he knows he's probably going to get double or triple that got it. because he's developed that kind of a clientele. Whereas I can go into a mall you know, an antique mall. I would. I was down in Southern um, Illinois, what took me down there. Oh, no, I was going to a, a private call. Costume shop was closing. She's getting out of the business. She's like 70, she didn't want to do it anymore. I've got all these costumes. Went down there, are you kidding me? Like 30s, like belted backs, great fedoras. I was just like, what? Um, and on the way back, I stopped at a, at a resale place and boom. Um, and then I was like, oh, you know, we've got an antique mall downtown. Oh, you do? So I went in, yeah. And here's hanging for $40, a 1930s Palm Beach suit, which Linen? I, Linen? I literally, Palm Beach is its own particular fabric. It's a okay. Um, and I almost lost my mind because I was like, oh, it's this Palm Beach cloth, what? I was like, I didn't ask for a barter or none of that stuff. I was like, I know I'm going to. And I got it here, I got it dry cleaned and stuff like that, and I went on to eBay and I was like, and it was 480. Nice. But could she have done that? Because no. I have now have, a, a, again, it sounds like a brag, but I have an established reputation now, and I've established myself as a menswear shop. So when people order, they know that they're gonna get it dry cleaned and it's gonna be, it, to the best of my knowledge, free of damage or if it's got repairs. I put the as is and here's the here's the issues and stuff like that. Honesty is the best policy. Yeah. But full but, transparency no matter yeah. what you're doing. But you find a lot of people like that do that online. There's a lot of people that have YouTube channels that that will go to the mall and because they've developed their own clientele base through their eBay or Etsy or whatever that they could pick up that, that she might have that little figurine at 8 and then well, I know I can get 20 for it. So I'm going to pick that up and you know, get it, and, but you got to get it and clean it and photograph it and then size it and then you got to box it and send it and all that stuff. So there's people think it's just like, oh, in and out, in and out. No, there's a lot of. There's a lot there's, in between. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, and I go above and beyond. Like I put my stuff in the window and I put it on the form and then I put a hat with it and a pocket square and a tie. You guys, you make these look so good. Thank you. Thank you. And I love your Instagram. It's, it's you, so great you. to follow. Nothing ever is my size. <laughs> But it looks so good. And I'm always like, what, where, hit, hit more, more. Oh, but here's it. another thing, though. I will have to say, so many of my competitors don't do that. Really? No size, no price. DM for, for. That's just annoying. So people do that in real estate, for instance. They won't give the details, just inquire yeah. about it. And then they're trying to hook you and bring you to another property. So it's a bait yeah. and switch, right? Yeah. yeah. I can't stand that stuff. You're just wasting everybody's time, Yeah. yeah. right? Like maybe yeah. that works. Maybe you can get some clientele and try to push them in some other direction. But like our listings are the same way. I'd give all the details. Mm -hmm. That way it's all there. Yeah. Everything you want to know is right there. You don't have to ask for it. It's just right there. Yeah. Now the ones for rental properties, the ones that drove me nuts because I I was kept looking. I loved like if you go down on Grand right before you hit the, um, the Express. Uh -huh. Some great old buildings there, and a lot of them are for rent. Now mm -hmm. I know why, because oh my God, they go for huge amounts of money just to rent them. Yeah. But they always go, oh, b -b -b so many per square feet. Well, as soon as and Google they're gonna make, And they're gonna make you like, so I have to go on, you know, try to Google it, try to figure out, okay, how much would that be a month? And I was like, 20,000 a month yeah. in rent? I'm like, what do you, you gotta be selling like luxury cars to make that kind of stuff. Do you see what I'm saying? So. Yeah, I think I think people get greedy. I think people like market themselves out and like again, as I was saying, I mean, this is a thousand square foot upper with a basement and a little kitchenette thing in the back. I'm like I said, if you think you're gonna get twenty five hundred dollars a month for that in this neighborhood at this time without a rehab, no, that's no. not gonna work. No. no. Now I'm not gonna tell everybody what I, I spend, but it's still very, very affordable. But I was smart and negotiated when I rented six years ago with a three year extension. So 
So you'll be here for a little bit. I'm here till 2023 at least. Well, I can't wait to see him see you finish this. I can't wait to see the new Well, that's space. the other thing. I was saying how I, I'm actually kind of falling in love with my landlord or the guy that owns the building because he's letting me pick whatever it happens. It's perfect. So it's I cho- I'm choosing the floors. I'm choosing the wall color and the back wall will stay the same because I was speaking to a friend. She was like, Richard, ain't broke. Don't fix it. She goes, everybody, doesn't everybody love your shop? Why would you change it if you don't have to? I said, well, that's true. So, yeah. So we're going to do hardwood or no, looks like hardwood. That, okay. That new industrial vinyl, vinyl mm-hmm. which makes it's very sense durable because of the so much wet. Yeah. He wanted to do hardwood. And I said, do, I was like, you can't do that. Like if a pipe bursts and stuff like that, that gets wet, that gets warped. That's going to be a hot mess. But this is going to be fully poured concrete, like from front to back. So they're going to bring it, the floor down. It's all going to be leveled. Okay. And, uh, and then everything gets rebuilt. So I get to pick the kitchen and I get to pick the bathroom and then I get to pick the floor. He's gonna drop the, he's gonna have a ceiling installed because it's not legal to have all that piping exposed. Okay. Right? No? No, you, you can know. have this. All that conduit yeah. and all that stuff exposed yeah. like that? that? So, well, not some of the stuff I see, but what you're referring yeah. to, yeah. yes. And I wouldn't do the ceiling because it's just gonna lower your ceiling height. Oh, but it's only enough to-, uh, to, to That's uh, three feet. To take up those pipes, yeah. Which the ductwork or the pipes? No, it's going to be down to the ductwork. That's just to the low. Top. I would not get rid of that ceiling height. Well, he wants to uh, can light it, and it needs to be done anyway. Man, it's yeah. you're giving up three feet though. Uh, the ceiling height, because you probably have about from the very bottom, you probably have about twelve feet here. A lot of these storefronts are fifth, some are fifteen. This is like eleven or twelve, I think. Ceiling height makes everything feel yeah. so big. Yeah. Like your store feels as big as it is. Oh, this had of that. a drop ceiling when I got here. Yeah, no, that's where the lip is from, and that's I'm going to keep that. Yeah. But so, but if if you did it down to the ductwork, you'd be at that lip again. No, not under the ductwork, above the ductwork. He's only. Putting You're going to be a, above the ductwork. Above the ductwork. Oh, that's yeah, fine. No, that's no, fine. No, that's no. fine. Yeah. That's fine. No. 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 Just enough. Because I told him, I said, you know, a lot of places have that. He yeah. wants to spray it. And I said, well, yeah. spray it. Yeah. Go, yeah. yeah I make agree. it pretty. I, agree. I said, but I told him, I said, you see that duct up there? Yes. You see all those marks underneath it? Yes. You know what that was? No. Water. I'm not kidding. When that. Oh. That Christmas, the, the, the day after the Christmas, whole, the, the whole first, ceiling, all that this? was like okay. a water feature. It ran and ran. These and are ran. all leaks. Yeah, you got a lot yeah. of leaks. See, look at what's going up over here in this corner. Oh, those are my hooks for my window displays. It's a lot of hooks. It is. <laughs> well, you go through my Instagram. Oh my like, God, it's over here too. <laughs> well, yeah, I did a, I did a, a, a primary color all Chinese lanterns. Okay. And I had a lot of them, like. And I like for Chinese New Year, just no, just because just it was because. just primary colors. I wanted bright. I wanted fun. Three of three of the what big are primary ones. colors, like the main Prim- color, like red, green, blue, okay. yeah, yeah, yellow. Yeah. Um, did different sizes, different heights. So I had made sure it was like visually pleasing from the front as well as the street. Three of the big ones that were like this big, all had lights inside. So I mean, it stopped traffic. Like people went nuts. <laughs> and I'm going to do a white version of it down the road. So I knew that I wasn't going to take all the hooks out because. Um, that was, it. but no one ever notices that stuff. You're because you're sitting here and now we're looking at the well, ceiling. Only when you noticed it, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So. Only when you pointed it out. Yeah. This guy looks like a Walter E. Smith sibling or something ah, you, over there. Seventies again, unsigned, no name. You know, everybody thinks that's uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. I said it's not. It's just, you know, there was a lot of like heavy set guys with those wire rim glasses and the mustache back then. It's just the, uh, yeah. But again, almost all of these were going to be thrown away. I mean, so many estates are like, oh. Psh, it's like, this is your ancestry. What the hell are you doing? No, nope, no, nope, we don't care. You think so. that was a sibling? A b- or like someone, member. a family member? Family member, They were sure. throw them away? Sure. Like the one with the big, big mustache to the right. That's Martin. I remember him. Martin? Because his wife <laughs> had the, the, the rag, you know, they, the women, the, 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 tie the, and... the Polish women. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, yeah. would have like the one yep. that would go down and yep. around. And so it was just the face. And I was like, what the hell? She was a big, big woman. And look how tiny that little guy was. Like... You knew who wore the pants in that family, so that's like, and she was mean. She, she was mean looking in her photo. But anyway, <laughs> but all of these were going to be pitched, and uh, so I was just like, so I decided that I wanted a wall of gentlemen. So it's weird though. I mean, the second I wanted to do it, then I couldn't find them anymore. So it's I don't know, but they'll come. They'll come. Those will all be realigned and much more laid out better. I when, love the frame in that one. Yeah. Well, that's where most of the value comes from. Them. Yeah. Is is the framing? But I picked like handsome gentlemen with great ties and that were still i mean there i see tons of them in the uniforms but i'm not a military collector so i don't i don't do that but yeah those are a little stiff yeah he was my the colorized one that was my first he hung on a wall at at an antique junk shop for 40 years before i picked him up 40 yeah 
Yeah. Wow. It's an old icky place in Indiana. A friend of mine took me there. I was like, is it safe to touch anything in here? But yeah, and I found some good stuff. I mean, but you got to get ready to get dirty and, and dig. You know, that's the, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, so there's so many, I mean, there's thrifting, there's resale shops, there's direct buys, there's uh, estate sales. There's just, you can't leave any stone unturned. Yeah. You know, you've got to kind of just, and, and if you walk in and you walk out with nothing, you know, I mean, of course it disappoints you because you always love to get a gem. But, because I've had to really learn that lesson hard too, because, but fortunately I'm, most of everything I find and I buy usually turns out to have some, somebody else loves it just as much as I do. So I put the energy on it, put the mojo. Well, I'm yeah. so happy you're here. I'm Thank so you. happy we did this. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for staying sure. in the neighborhood and providing this value because I want more people to come here so they find your shop and they get as much pleasure out of it as I do. And I would love for you to maybe find tenants to come over here. Absolutely. To, or, or go talk to Chuck and get him. I, I want to talk to Chuck. To, I want to talk to your landlord. And I want to talk to the Armitage, Armitage and Wolcott person. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what they're selling those? What's that? The lots? The lot, oh, it's already sold. It's already sold. Yeah. That, and that's why they're having to clean out as quickly yeah. as they are. Um, they sold four lot. Man, it's amazing. I'm well, don't use it. this. But yeah. That's, uh, that doesn't even seem bad. For the lots. Yeah. yeah. For four lots. Like, yeah. There. Well, Armitage like and Wolcott. Yeah. But again. Or do they want to come in shop? Uh, I don't know. You want to come in? Okay. Oh, they're probably looking at the apartment upstairs. Got it. Okay. I, I heard someone running around. I think we're, oh, that was Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, the landlord, he came. He was going to come in here too, and I was just like, <laughs> I'm having my camera moment. I love the the previous uh, manager here, Will, would come by. And when I had WGN was here and he tried to come in that day and he uh -huh. was just like, what the? And then Chuck would walk him by kind of like, like Richard's always got them TV people in there. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all good, cool. all good. Well, thank you so much. You got it. I appreciate it. Yeah.